All right. So knife, we're gonna go for knife defense. Um, a lot of things happen when you do when you do knife. A few a few years ago, I started working for the, the French Ministry of Defense, and I, I trained the French Special Forces, French President Security, in knife defense. I'm not saying that to wow. I'm saying that because I had the opportunity to access some uh, to have access to some uh, Interpol. Interpol statistics, international knife attack statistics, and that helped me to completely redesign my knife program. I had a traditional Filipino knife program, nothing wrong about it, but when I realized how real knife attacks in the real world happen, uh, I decided to change everything. Basically, 71% of all knife attacks starts like this. Left leg forward, the right hand grabs, push, or grab the neck, the knife is hidden along the, the leg, and the stab goes to the stomach, multiple stabs. So that's 71% of all knife attacks around the world. So I've decided to make that my priority. Since in a seminar like this, we don't have time to see every possible attack that a knife can do, I focus a lot on that attack, knowing that if you ever need to defend yourself against a knife attack, it will most probably be something like that. The second stats that I want to share with you, the average knife attacks, the guy, if the guy dies, if the guy dies, there is 27 holes in his body. So it's no fun. It's not like I slash you and you give me a wallet and I leave. Guys who go for knife, they're crazy. And when someone is crazy, it's difficult to control. Okay. So what we're going to do, and I think that's something we have in common with your art, we're going to work on structure. I don't care what you do, I don't care how strong you are when you punch the bag. If you can take the other guy's structure, if you can take his center, if you can take away his balance, there's nothing you can do. Okay? You can punch like a horse when you punch the bag. Some guy, they won't feel it. Some guy will stand up, especially if they're using drugs. But if they're out of balance slightly, if you manage to take the center, if you manage to dis disturb the structure, then any punch will take them down. It doesn't matter if you're a small lady or a big guy. So that's what we're going to play with. Okay? First, can I ask you to help me? Awesome. So whether you're left-handed, right-handed, it doesn't matter. We're all going to work on that 71% kind of attack. Okay? So he's going to be exactly in this position, and he's going to push me, grab me. This hand sometimes grabs, sometimes it's just here to understand the, the distance. So you have to understand that we are both under a huge amount of stress. It's life and death situation for the two of us, for the defender, but for the attacker also. When you're under attack and your life is in danger, your cognitive function goes down, all the way down to the floor, which means everything you think you'll do in a knife defense situation, you won't. Except if you have 25, 30, 40 years of training and that becomes a second nature for you. That's why train hard, train often, and train for a long time. Five years of martial arts will get you nowhere if your life is in danger. Nowhere. Ten years is kindergarten. Twenty-five years you start college. And you may have a chance to understand what self-defense and martial arts is all about. So it's very important to know that our ability to think is almost zero when our life is in danger. So I'm here, okay? He's, he's coming with a knife. And in my head, I'm, I'm training at the dojo, and I'm thinking, okay, I'm gonna take his hand, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that, I'm gonna grab him, and I'm gonna, and he's gonna change hand, and if he change hand, I'm gonna do this, and I'm gonna do that. Well, he's not gonna change hand. Even if we're here, in the middle of the fight, in training, he could. But in reality, statistics tells us that 0.01% of attacker change hand even if they need it. Why? Because they can't think as well as I can think. Remember, when you're under stress, your cognitive functions are almost zero. Your ability to access what you know intellectually is zero, nothing, 0.01%. Okay? So what I want to do, I want to use as little of my brain as possible. So my first reflex is going to come to me, keep pushing me, Apply forward pressure and keep stabbing, keep stabbing, keep stabbing. I'm gonna put a wall 
between the blade and my body. That's my first reflex, okay? Here, I'm gonna put a wall. Keep coming, keep coming, okay? Two things are gonna happen here. Number one, he won't realize that he's being blocked for a few seconds because again, he doesn't have the ability to, to think clearly, just like me. So it's gonna take a few seconds, average five seconds for him to realize that I'm blocking him. He doesn't really know, he just goes crazy, he's blind, he doesn't see anything. It's gonna take him five seconds average to realize that I'm blocking him and he didn't touch me. So during those five seconds, I know he's gonna do the same thing. So I have an opportunity. That's the first thing you want to know. The second thing is, this is not a block. Because here, I'm using several joints. Okay, it's a polyarticular movement. It's too complex. It's gonna take too much of the little brain power that I have at that moment. I need to save that brain power. I have maybe 1% of my personal knowledge, intelligence, intellect, whatever you wanna call it. I have 1% that I can access in this situation. If I use it to coordinate this joint, this joint, this joint, to be at the same speed as him and to be precise to make sure I never miss him, if I use that, I have nothing left. Nothing left to elaborate a strategy. Nothing left to survive. All my brain power, the little that I have, will be here. Making sure I don't miss it, making sure I don't block the blade, making sure all everything is aligned, so I don't want that. I don't want you to move your arm at all. I just want you to create a wall and you don't have to think about it anymore for five seconds. Come on, Kim. Keep coming, keep coming, keep coming. Yes, that's all I want you to do. So basically, this is Mexico, this is the United States, and this is Trump. You, that's a wall. You have a nice, strong wall, and you're not moving it. The wall is going nowhere. Okay? Go. Because you still have tomorrow and the day after that. <laughs> and I promise you, you're gonna be all black and blue and, and pink and yellow. It's gonna hurt. So don't go like a maniac for now. We're gonna have few moments with high intensity, so you can feel it, you can decide for yourself if you think that will help you in a, in a real situation or as, as close as we can. But don't go 100% all the time, okay? So, the first thing I want you to do is to forget that wall, to, to build it and forget it. Grab me, push me, yes, that's it, okay? This hand, don't worry about it for now. What I want is this, my turn. So you just make contact, don't worry about this hand, I'll tell you what to do with it later. Yep. Just create your wall, and what I'm doing is this. I'm trying, really trying to get him, okay? That's it, only that. Don't go too hard for now. Today, what Sean's got is a knife, and we're gonna play with a couple knife concepts that we use and try that. Now, I'm gonna put this out there. Uh, there are many different uh, concepts on knife defense, uh, how to defend against it, and my suggestion to you guys who are actually seriously con uh, concerned about knife attacks and wanna learn how to defend against knife attacks is actually train and drill, and try to train it in the most realistic scenario. Um, and our, due to our Sean's and I background, we have a background in Japanese Jiu-Jitsu, and obviously Japanese Jiu-Jitsu comes from Samurai. Uh, which weapons based was their, their mode of combat. So uh, we use a lot of their principles in our training, uh, but as well as adapting from other things as well. So we're gonna go through uh, some concepts in place today and just entering in and getting control of the knife first, and then we'll go to some finishes. So uh, can I borrow the knife really quick? What are our instructors, uh, Shion Russ St. Hilaire, uh, talked about this concept called the circle of, a circle of death, which I, I really like and I, I appreciate a lot. If I drew an oval basically around Sean's vital areas, I, I come up with a circle of death. Yeah. Very vital area. <laughs> um, and so the circle of death is where our objective is to keep the knife out of that range. So we're going to look at uh, two major uh, angles of attacks. One is that close range grab as well as uh, the, the high attacks, okay? Uh, and then put a little combination of how we can defend against it. All right, so first, I'll start off with Sean. No idiot in the world, and if you watch a lot of videos on, uh, on knife fighting, you see a lot, a lot of knife attacks on like Live Leak or YouTube, you can find some. No one ever says, hi, I have a knife, I'm going to stab you now, all right? <laughs> um, most of the time, that knife is, is hidden, concealed, or is coming out with a, with a touch, or it's a very close encounter. Um, the only time you can truly defend against a knife is actually if we are facing the knife. Obviously, if I'm behind Sean, and I decide to stab him repeatedly, well, that's a whole other area of something we need to deal with. 
That being said, um, we do say that knife is one of the most deadliest weapons that you're going to face. Um, and people do get attacked from, the, from behind all the time. It doesn't mean they can't survive it. It doesn't mean they can't defend against it, but they're already behind. Okay, so let's talk about uh, first. So we saw one of the first close quarters kind of. Now, anytime uh, someone is addressing us, talking to us, we can never just be like, yo, what's up, man? And not knowing what's going to happen. We should already be in some sort of, we talked about our, our tri-tac uh, tri problem. It's a conversation stance. My hands, my, I should almost be in that stance ready. My hands should be in front of me, so I'm like, hey, hey, hey. Uh, and if I do see a knife or he gets really violent, I should be breaking down into my fence position. So uh, we're going to start right now from that fence where I, I, I have an aggressor in front of me or I, I see the weapon. Uh, so I'm going to start from my fence. Now, when we do see a knife, our, our, our stance may change. But right now, we're kind of more of a combative hand-to-hand -hand combat uh, stance where we may be striking, uh, grappling. When the knife comes out, it's, we want to start what we call hollowing our body out. We're actually trying to remove our vital organs from that target and start elongating our, our defensive weapons, all right? So that first low attack, we're going to take what we call the frame four, and we're going to elongate. So when he comes in for that knife attack, we're going to be looking to block and keep that knife on the outside line, not let it come in, as well as a dual strike to the neck, all right? And from this position, we're going to feed through and add a knee. Very, very basic at first. So when he comes in, block, feed, knee. And what we're all trying to do is... Uh, I can use it in Xi'an, but I said, remove the target, control the weapon. I'll control the body, uh, then control the weapon. So the first thing, boom, I remove the target, okay? My target was my midsection, right? I removed it by hollowing out and putting in my frame four defense and volume frame four defense. Now I'm going to control the body, so now I'm going to push forward in. And I, as I'm pushing forward in, I'm looking to hook this arm, hook it back in the neck, knee, I'm going to knee to the face as well, all right? So that's our first base layer. So he comes in, boom, knee. Boom, me. Okay. Uh, now, when you're the attacker for your partner, don't just be putting that out there. I'm thinking about where I want to get him. I'm trying to drive that knife up in there. That's helping him out. Help him train properly. And, and, and Sean is exactly right there. It's like if we train like dumbasses, we're gonna kill like dumbasses, right? So it's just like uh, I'm gonna punch Sean in the face so he can defend it, and not punching in the face and punching somewhere off. It's like you're doing your partner a disservice. Okay. So, uh, one more time, we're here, boom, knee, all right? Now, let's talk about the high line attack. So, a high line attack is, we can think about, it could be a slash or it could be a stab. Uh, we'll play a little combination how we can play, uh, train these together. So, the high line attack is, now it's almost like, we're almost like, we're like almost going to old school karate block, right? So, that's our first layer of defense, and now we're at our second, we'll go right back to our neck, boom. And what it looks like is we're actually in our fence position. So, we actually think about, we're trying to use what, and tri tack we have already. We have a frame four uh, that we use like, like almost a Philly shell type of feel, very common in uh, Filipino martial arts. Um, so that's a framing concept for knife fence. And then we use our fence. So when he throws that, that knife, boom. Now I'm fencing up. Now we're gonna go back to the same exact thing, knee, knee, all right? Uh, again, guys, we're just talking about uh, entering in right now. Next week, we'll show you how to uh, chain off of these, all right? So, now let's play together a combination. He stabs low, boom, he comes high, boom, all right? And now uh, we can start free flowing a little bit. Oh, I got that. Oh, yeah. Now, I want to plug in, so those are two. We did a low one, boom. We did high, boom. Now let's talk about before I even decide to enter in, uh, and I want to keep him away from me. We were working uh, last week in our classes on the oblique kick and the front kick. Great tools for also keep him away. He stabs in, boom. I start kicking his knee out. Sorry about that. <laughs> now I actually can keep my distance by using my longer range weapons. If he puts it, put the knife out to full range, easy, right? I can start hitting that knee. I can start plugging the front kicks instead. So it gives me extra little range. Now, hypothetically, again, I have a nice threatened at me. I never had been stabbed with him. But hypothetically, that I may block my attacker two, three times, and there's no need for me to actually defend because maybe he gets frustrated and says, screw it, this guy is, I'm not going to be able to hit him, or something else happens. Uh, someone else, get, there's eight million different scenarios that can actually happen in a situation. But I may never need to use an actual 
Japanese Jiu Jitsu or tri attack defense, I can just use a simple kick and nothing, uh, something like that. So what we have our students do is we put them have a little uh, blocking flow that combines something we have. So first time, come in, boom, oblique kick. Second time, boom, here. Third time, boom, here, all right? So now they're starting to learn different ways they can start chaining uh, knife attacks together. Okay, so the very common, I grab it, he parries it, blocks, boom. Now I'm gonna go back to my first one. He re resets, boom, I'm back to my high line, and obviously finish him there. Okay, guys, uh, because we're doing hacking, uh, hacking is part of knife defense. Um, I need to explain the circle concept and the theory that goes with the footwork uh, that goes with the hacking and the passing and the, the blasting of knife defense. Okay, so um, I'm going to be in a right lead with a knife in my right hand and I have this tape on the floor so I want you to see the arc of a knife attack if it's a slash or if it's a stab, okay? So on a slash, all right? If it comes around my body, you see how it makes this circular arc with the middle, the center of my body being the longest point, and now it starts tapering off. On the opposite side, it'll taper off more because my opposite shoulder is away, so the hand comes in and it's even less. Okay, so this is my maximum distance. And if I had this on the floor, you could see I would make a circle if I would just extend it like this, okay? Now this is my knife slashing circle, okay? Now being in the middle is bad because that's my maximum impact, whether I'm thrusting or slashing. All right, this is where I'm coming in. All right, so um, we're gonna call this a three o'clock attack because we're gonna look at a clock and a nine o'clock attack. Whether we are thrusting or slashing or thrusting or slashing with the blade in our hand from a three or a nine. And it can also be in, this would be forward grip or reverse grip. Some people call this hammer grip and ice pick grip. So right now we're gonna hold the grip in forward grip and I'm gonna thrust on three o'clock and thrust on nine o'clock. Okay, and we're using the clock analogy to, to determine the angles. Okay, it's coming in at three, coming in at nine. Or coming in at nine, coming in at three if I'm doing a slash. Okay, now with that being set, I'm going to reverse my position so you can see where I'm coming off on this circle and why my side stepping is so important um, with this theory in mind. Okay, so we're going to break it now and go back to switching place. Okay guys, so uh, I'm going to start in a neutral stance and I'm at this circle and remember what I said before, this is the arc of a knife attack. So if I'm right here, this is where I'm going to be killed if it's a thrust or a slash on that arcing knife attack, okay? So, first thing we're gonna do is go neutral and do a 90 degree sidestep. So, if I have a knife attack coming in this way, and I'm just gonna be moving my body first, I wanna get my body off of this circle line. So, I'm gonna be taking this leg and moving it out and facing the blade, which changes my body angle, and you see what that does to the arc of the circle it brings me away from that arc. So I'm here, and my, my right foot is like doing a letter C, okay, where I step back and out. So I make more distance away from the circle and get my body off the line from getting cut or stabbed here. It's now over here, okay? So this is the footwork part, okay? On the other side, if the attack is coming in this way, I would make like a reverse C with this foot bringing my body this way, okay? Now I'm, I'm doing a 90 degree side step. So it's 90 degree, one, or 90 degree, one. Okay, now I'm gonna do a 180 degree side step. So I'm gonna start with a 90, one, two, and now the attack's coming this way, so I gotta turn my body a complete 180 to get off this line again, okay? So the first one would be an attack coming in this way. And I get off line, it passes me. Now it's coming back in this way. So I gotta get off this line, my body's facing this way. So now I'm gonna do a 180. So I turn my body and now I'm off line. Okay, now it passes me this way. Okay, in application, I'll have Mike come up and you'll see it, I'll add the hacks and the pass. 
Okay guys, so now this is the beginning of knife defense. And we just explained the circle. We also explained sidestepping and how sidestepping takes your body off of line. Now we're gonna get into the hand part, which is hacking. Hacking is gonna make sense when we go back to the fence. So I'm in the fence, I say, hey, I don't want no problems. And next thing I know, he grabs something from his waistband and it's a knife and he's coming in at this three o'clock angle. Now the angles are extremely important because the angles determine the defense. But the defenses have to be ingrained so quick where they're instinctual, because this is a knife. And if I screw up with a knife, I die. It only takes one poke or one slash on a bad artery and I'm dead, okay? So this is why knife is deadly force and the responses can be extremely violent. Um, uh, he's gonna take my life so I can take his life with my empty hand techniques. They could be as ruthless as possible and they should be because the level of force now is my life. It's not a funch or a kick, it's my life. And that has to be a certain mindset. So he is murdering me. So anything goes in my arsenal, okay? I'm not gonna respond with just a punch or a slap. I'm gonna crush his throat and do whatever I can to kill him because he's trying to kill me, okay? So remember that this isn't, uh, I'm, not, I'm not engaging a knife fighter um, because any other reason that I have to engage because the door is that way and there's no other way out and I'm not gonna engage him on physical force. I'm gonna engage him on deadly force because he's bringing deadly force to me. Okay, so if I have a weapon, of course, I'm going to elevate the level of force to deadly with, by expanding my force to deadly force with a weapon. But if not, my empty hand striking is going to be with the intention of deadly force, not just to hurt him. Okay, so with that being said, uh, we're going to work on the three o'clock line and I'm in my fence and we're going to train this progressively. So I'm going to start off in a neutral stance and I'm at the apex of the circle. So when the thrust comes in and we'll start with a thrust. He's coming with a three o'clock thrust to me, to my neck, okay? Or it could be my shoulder, my whatever angle, however level he wants, but it's coming in on this three o'clock line. Okay, so the first thing I'm gonna do is back to the fence. So using this side, this is what we call a hack. I would be hacking just to buy myself enough time to change my angle off this circle. Okay, so this is my oh shit. So I'm here and it's a knife and it's oh, and now I change my line with my footwork as I pass, and that would be a 90 degree side step. So it's here, and I change myself 90 degrees. So I'm here, it comes in, oh shit, this is a shot. So I'm meeting it, and it sucks. It's all in this radial line, it's, it, it hurts for him, all right? But it doesn't mean he's not gonna be able to still kill me. So this is like a placeholder, so I can get my body out of line and pass, okay? Because I don't wanna stay here, and then he cuts low, and I die. Okay, so, and I don't want to match strength with strength. He's bigger and stronger than me. He might cave it in and kill me. So this is just a pop and I get my body offline. Okay, now from this side, I'm already turned to him. He's going to come back and I'm, and this is just a drill. I'm going to go, again, put my hack on this side, but now I can't stay here because he'll gut me underneath this way. Okay, so I got to move my body offline, out of line and open him up. And this is learning how to pass the blade. This is, oh shit. It's just uh, the brick between the, the mortar between the bricks, and all you, everything's going to come off this type of movement. All right. Anytime I deal with a knife attack, I can have a side escape, or I can step back and have a rear escape where I'm not in the distance. Okay. So at this point in the training, we're learning how to side step in order to invade an oncoming three or nine. I could also step back, and of course, I would invade it as well. But this particular drill. Say there's a wall behind me and I got nowhere to go backwards. So I have to get to the side or to the side. Okay, so we're learning this type of sidestepping escape first. Okay, so my feet are neutral. I'm in the oh shit. One and I pass. One and I pass. So I'm sidestepping and learn how to just redirect the blade so I can get back on offense. And when I pass, I'm passing from the top down. All right, now I'm here. Top, down. All right, we're gonna add all the other stuff after you get this drill down. Okay, so the idea would be I do block, pass, and to close the line, or block, pass, to push to make space, so I could get my own force in. Okay, it's either I'm gonna enter or I'm gonna exit, but I'm using passing right now. Okay, if he has the knife in the other hand, you gotta switch and do it the same other way. 
oh shit, and then 90 degrees offline. He comes back in, I go 180 and offline. And then I'll reset the drill. So I'm good for a 90 degree side step, or I'm good for a 180 degree side step. So how to move my body out of line so I don't get cut or thrust stamped. Okay, and it's all about moving the body with the hands being secondary as backups. Okay, so the way we're gonna train it, we're gonna go slower first and relax. One, two, so it's hack, pass, hack, pass, hack with the side. Hack, pass, hack, pass. And you can see where your fence is always coming back up. Hack and pass, fence back up, hack, fence, pass back up. Why back up and why high? Because we want to use gravity. If my fence is here and it's a high line above, I got to come up. If my fence is already high, remember when we taught you the fence, where it was? Eyebrows, here. So I use gravity. Now he's got to, if he stamps any higher, it's over my head. But anywhere below my hands, it's gonna, I can use gravity to hack and pass. So we are, from the beginning, starting with a good precedent for knife fighting and knife defense. Even though you didn't know it and you were just in this, I don't want any trouble. You're also pre-framing for knife defense and knife offense on the arm side, which we won't discuss here in the unarmed side, just the defense on the unarmed side. Okay, so one more time. He's got the grip and hammer grip, and this can work in, in um, ice pick or reverse grip as well. Doesn't matter if you turn the knife over. If he goes in with reverse grip, it's the same. Uh, thrust, right in, and then I pass. Right in, and I pass. And you say, oh, I see a lot of guys, they tap with their hand up when they do knife tapping, and Turn with your hand up. It makes sense when you're here, you see a lot of knife tapping. The problem with knife tapping with the hand up is when the knife is in reverse grip and I hack and now I tap. If he pulls in, he, guts my, he cuts my whole pulse line. So I just teach one way to tap and that's palm down. So you're not gonna be able to guess if the guy has it in hammer grip or reverse grip. So just teach it one way so you're safe no matter what. If I have passed with hammer down and he goes in, all my tendons are on the inside and I can also shoot the hand out. But he, all my real major arteries on the inside. So traditional knife tapping can be very dangerous with a blade when it's held in reverse grip. So I don't teach tapping like this, I teach tapping like this from the beginning and only that way. Okay, so go back to hammer grip. So with that being said for the knife guys out there, <coughs> um, I go back to fence, a hack and this is a shot and it's also a placeholder for me to move my body. It's a moment in time for me to get out of the line. So it's oh fuck and I move. And then the other side is oh fuck and I move. All right, when we get into the counter offense, because there is no knife defense, it's only counter offense, which means I, I'm never gonna play this game of defending. The only way he's gonna stop stabbing me is if I hurt him. So I gotta go on offense right away. All right, so I'm not gonna be knife tapping any more than once or twice. For the drill, I'll do it for an hour because I wanna get good at the skill set of tapping. In reality, one or two taps and I'm gonna be putting pain on him. It's just the oh shit of, I'm, somebody's fucking stabbing me and I'm getting out of line. But now it's my turn. All right, now I'm gonna add my offense in. But you, this knife tapping has to be so instinctually into you or it will never come out when you need it fast enough. So you need to put reps in this to make this boom. You could just bang it out instinctually. If it's anything less than instinctually, you're gonna die. Okay, and that's with any defense against the blade, because that's the nature of a blade. If you get stabbed once, there's no second chance, it's not a punch. You get stabbed in the, in the heart, in the lung, in the eye, it, it, there is no second chance on that. So, um, you know, there's a lot of nonsense out there. You just, it's, it's a dangerous world with the blade, and that's why it's deadly force, and that's why my force can be elevated. But you need to have this so you can have all your offense. Okay guys, so uh, just before we did passing, okay? So I was in my fence, I hacked him just to buy myself time so I could use my side step to get my body offline. I used Gorilla Grip to come down and pass it. And now I was in here and then I did a 180, hack into a 180 side step into Gorilla Grip and open him up. Now, passing is great and there's a time and a place to pass. Usually when I pass, it's because I'm gonna set up something else like another hit or close the line. Okay, so I wanna stay more connected to him. The uh, next thing I'm gonna show you is blasting, what we call blasting. And it's using the hammers after the hack 
to destroy the knife wielding arm. So he would come in the same way and I would have the same placeholder of, oh fuck, here comes a, a thrust that's going to fucking kill me. And I'm going to get offline, but as I get offline, I add in descending hammer with my strike. So even if it's cutting in, and it is hurts like a hell. So we, you know what we train with? The, the forearm guards, we turn the forearm guards around. So the forearm guards are, are protecting this whole pulse line here, which is like this nerve that runs all the way down from your wrist to your elbow. It really sucks when you get hit there. Okay. So I'm going to just do it light on mic. So I'm back into the fence to buy myself time. And when I turn, I attack the pulse line. And now from here, I can get my own force in, run, or enter again. But now it's more of a, a destroying thing where I'm losing a connection as opposed to passing and making a connection. Okay? So it's more about destroy, and now there's going to be a break in the action because I just destroyed it. So I lost any kind of connection I have with the hand. Okay? Which is, which is fine. Um, but you just got to know the result of that. So if you're going to make space and increase time, then you can increase force because there's more time for you to get the new force out or you could just run all right so attacking it fence hammer as i sidestep if i'm here hack hammer on the outside all right i'm using descending hammer across that radial line and when you feel it throw on stuff and you can go full force and feel it. this is pretty devastating he'll probably drop the blade he'll definitely feel it and give him a reason to slow down the stabbing and let you get on counter offense. Remember, there is no defense in knife fighting or knife defense, in my opinion. It's only counter offense. He's only going to stop stabbing me when he's in pain and hurt, which requires my offense. Not defense, my counter offense. Okay? Okay, guys. So before we had, we started with high hack. Okay? High external hack. And now what happens if the blade comes underneath my elbow? I'm just gonna rotate my elbow down and do low hack, and this is like a low oh shit. So I'm here, and if the attack goes below my elbow, but also on that three o'clock line, it's not a six o'clock line, it's still coming in on that side angle, and I'm using the clock as an analogy, three or nine o'clock. So it's here, but it's underneath my elbow, you see, so I can't use high hack. So what I do is this stops, and I just rotate my elbow down, my hand down on the axis of my elbow to stop the blade from stabbing me, so I have enough time to do my side step and get offline and then pass. Okay, and on the other side, if he goes low on here, now I, instead of a 90, I gotta do a 180 and that's to protect that just for a second to open him up. Okay, and this is all gonna be fluid and make sense, okay? So I'm here, it goes low, one, two, and on here, low, one, two, and I learn how to tap and move my body with the tap. This is like an oh shit, okay, until I can pass the blade and either put some beating on him or elevate my force so I can multiply his force and take his life instead of him taking mine. All right guys, today we're gonna to start looking at um, knife defense in the tri-tac um, tri world, especially the tri-tac jiu-jitsu world. And a couple of rules I follow is that from my knife defense really comes from uh, Shion Ross and Lair and Japanese jiu-jitsu, as well as being influenced from you know, John Lebo, uh, Mike, uh, the Filipino martial arts, etc. So, um, one of the things that we first start off of is where the knife can't touch. And one of the concepts that we got is called circle of death. As I draw an oval around Anthony, like that's that oval that that knife cannot come in. It can't get to, you know, stabbing any of the vital organs, obviously the face, and then getting into uh, the arteries and the legs. So our main objective is to keep that knife out of there, right? And I look at angles, and I'm not going to put Anthony in this. So if Anthony has a knife, um, first off, this is, about it. this is not real knife defense. Okay, uh, knife is a close quarters combat deadly weapon that shows up when it's really in this spot. All right, uh, we're talking like that close range attack where someone's coming up and stabbing. If you got someone dancing and playing around with a knife, that's different. Um, you know, hopefully you can pick up a weapon yourself or they're just threatening you. But we're talking about once someone starts on the base level, I start going that that prison stab, close quarters. Uh, how to start dealing with that? So, first thing. If we look at he's got an angle and we think about I've got two lines that I'm coming I can come through to move that arm out or I come out to move the arm in all right so the first one we're gonna look at the outside line I want to start doing a low hacking low hacking I'm also gonna start with stepping forward so I'm like moving that out of the way just trying to get it outside my peripheral or outside my well, outside my line 
The next thing I'm doing, well, I have to do something. I can't just all say, just grab onto that wrist. That's bullshit, all right? I know he's be pulling back, stabbing again. I've got to put something in his face. So he just tried to stab me here. He's essentially committed his hands down. If I'm moving out of that way in that one step, he's giving me a clear shot. So now our first set, boom, I'm driving everything over that overhand left, that hook to put my body on. Now I can stay on there and follow up and run if I need to, if that's the situation I'm in. Uh, if not, we're starts getting glued to it. So once I come here, boom, I put my shot in. I'm now looking to capture that knife there. I know he's me pulling it back. So as he's pulling it back, I'm looking to hug it to my body because my hand is already there. So boom, I'm looking for this shot, right? Now to keep that weapon away from him and me, I don't want him getting back on. I don't want him to switch his hand. So as I'm punching, I'm also stepping through and driving and walking in. So I get this feel, okay? I see more shots here, hammers, I get out, I can break the elbow just right from here, all right? Um, so that's kind of the first thing, you, got, you could get the break for elbow right from here. And the first one to go to is I now just put my hand on the ground, I keep leaning on it, all the way to the ground. I then sit through, two hands on one, and I pull it up to break it. Now when we're doing knife combat, I wait for him to stop, that, take that knife away. If I'm gonna hold it, that's fine. Um, I cannot kill him right now, all right? If I hold, I can't just go stab him because then I'll be going to jail for murder. All right, I now need to either throw it away or control it and keep him on the ground as I get up. The great just a simple neon belly or neon shoulder. So again, that's a kind of first uh, knife is that we're using that entrance, the low hack, throwing like an overhand left into, uh, we call it Ikajo in Japanese Jiu-Jitsu. I'm flattening him out and controlling that knife. So again, you're here, nice and close. Boom, I'm coming through. They step through. I'm keeping this here, walking that hand to the ground, pulling it away from him, sitting through so my, my legs and thighs from underneath. So I'm isolating that shoulder, keeping him down on the ground. I pull up on it on to snap it. My buddy lets go with it. I take it, hold it. Two hands on one. I use it to get myself up. Knee on the shoulder, and I've got control. <laughs> One more time, all right, from here, boom, boom, coming through, on it, break it, and go, okay? That's the first one, so I'd be uh, low hack uh, to overhand left uh, to Ikajo. Stop it there. That makes sense? Okay, next one, we're going to follow off of our low hack into the overhand left uh, to Ikaja, but we're going to turn it into a Kosaru, um, I'm sorry, Kodi Gyash. So Kodi Gyash is essentially a wrist twist, and we're going to talk about, first we'll drop the knife really quick. So, open hand position is that I'm looking for like my thumbs to be mirrored <clears throat> around his knuckles, and then my three fingers in here are in his palms. These are your power fingers, these are your fine minute control fingers, okay? So here, when I, start, when I apply this technique, I'm looking essentially to make a box. That his, if I draw, obviously it's imaginary over here, but you can see it's at a 90 degree angle. Now I don't try to push it or pull it. I think about taking this knuckle and trying to rotate it and spin it around while maintaining my box. What happens is this will kink the wrist, which will kink the shoulder, which will kink, I'm sorry, kinks the wrist, kinks the elbow, kinks the shoulder, which kinks the hip. I keep adding pressure, it drops, I, I do is I stay on that elbow. I want to continue to control. I can snap it right there or go on to something else if I need to, okay? So now when we put a knife in his hand, before we got this technique, it changes a little bit, right? I'm still looking for that control, but I almost am trying to like hold it now and get this like my palms start rotating and pushing that knife around. So it's like my fingers are here. My, my thumbs are still engaged, but I'm looking to have that like, almost like I'm trying to cut him and, and drive it in and add that rotation, okay? So if you look, I'm still creating my square, but because his hand position is a little different, I'm using like the hilt of the knife as a driving tool, okay? So now let's bring it back to our defense. So again, so if you didn't see the other video about the low hack entrance to overhand, the same, same entrance, we got one, two, now I'm over it. Now, I think about I'm gonna fall, come here, break on that arm, but I'm getting my two hands on one right off the bat, right? This is good when I know he's strong and he's pulling back up over it, right? Now, a little adaptation, I can take his elbow and whip it through to get him going, but watch my footwork on this. So, I was over here, he's coming back up. I let the elbow come over, my left leg retracts, and I spin around while creating that L, drop it to the ground, 
stay on it, get the knife, boom, if I need to knock him out, not going to kill him, or just get back up, okay? My personal philosophy, and then you have to look at your own uh, legal rules for the state you live in or what situation you're in. Um, but anytime someone tries to kill me with a knife, I'm not going to necessarily kill him, uh, but I am going to put him in a position where he cannot use this again. Uh, that means breaking his arm, breaking his wrist. That's well within my use of force. Uh, that I, I am not going to allow. He's trying to kill me. I'm just going to take out what just tried to kill me. All right. That does not mean I can then just decide to kill him or beat the fuck out of him after. Uh, I will have legal issues after. All right. And moral issues. So, one more time again. So we're here. Boom. Boom. Coming through on that arm. All right. Now, if I can start adding more structure, break him down, and instantly put him right back in. The more movement I can add to it, the better it becomes. So, sorry, Anthony. <laughs> if I think about, I'm um, here, making it like catching up, trying to pull on it, and then I change that angle, boom, 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 boom. I have a violent response that's hard for people to actually keep up with. Okay, so one last time on this. One, two, boom. Over it, I can add rotation, or just backtrack out. Whip it across, drop them, stay on it, take the knife, and control. Talk about, uh, well, first of all, no matter what we are doing the knives with each other, uh, we always end up with a knife after we're training. We don't hand it back to them. Um, we take it a little more seriously, so it's not as fun as the BJJ stuff. It's more, a little more, take a little, when you're doing a wep at weapons combative, take it a little more seriously. Uh, number three, the only time we're actually engaging a knife is because we have to. If there's an exit opportunity to avoid it, escape, then we just do that instead. I'm not going to choose to uh, uh, fight a knife, right? It's probably one of the most common, but those deadly weapons. Uh, Sheehan Russell has a great concept called Circle of Death that we be draced to draw an oval uh, around his vital areas. Um, the objective is to keep the knife out of that region, all right? Uh, then would be control the body, uh, and then would be control the weapon. So we we'll start off, well, we'll go, we'll go with the most kind of common uh, attack. All right, so the time we get a deal with a knife too is when it's right in front of us. If I am behind Josh and I stab him, well, that's, that's uh, really nothing you can really do about that. It doesn't mean you can't survive and fight off, but you've already got stabbed and you're behind time. So uh, we we'll start very close quarters that it's been drawn and just, uh, in there a little bit. all right, that makes it feel good, okay? So first thing, um, when that when we actually we're close enough we shouldn't have allowed that to happen that we're that's close uh we should be having some sort of if there's any sort of action by him anything movement we should already be fencing out and creating space right when we're in a regular hand-to-hand -hand combat fight that we're more let's say uh, our, our our hands could vary our body distance could vary but once a knife appears our our action has to be starting to hollow out it goes back to that circle of death i want to remove all the major shit that can get killed all right so we're we'll gonna start off, he comes out, and once he gets his here, look at, first off, just grab it. We're gonna start off just right there. Once he grabs it, just get on that wrist. All right, first thing. So we're here, he starts pulling out, and howl out, and boom, he didn't tap him. Yeah. So he howls out, and I'm gonna look to grab that wrist right off the bat. Right? That's my only thing. I saw something happen, I slid back, okay, I see it coming, that's why I get on that as quick as possible. Uh, the way I like to think about it is I like right hand bottom, and you, any way you grab is gonna be better than nothing, right? Uh, but having this like stopper that my right hand on the inside is gonna keep that travel in here, control like the movement, and this is kinda gonna stop, stop the traffic. So I'm almost like looking to hit the, the wrist and the elbow, and like open hand, then control. Make sense? So I may, I, he may attack first, and I got, he pulls that right back. As I gotta be ready to go again. So then maybe that's the time I grab it. All right, so have the ability. If you didn't catch on the first beat, bullshit, and right back to that defensive fence position, looking to uh, uh, keep monitoring that arm. Make sense? All right, so uh, next beat, we're gonna go same exact thing. So we're hollowing out, tax it. We're gonna pull it to the ground, get him off balance, come around, deal. I mean, I'm trying to be nice, but I'm gonna, I'm trying to knee through that thing, okay? <laughs> so again, I howled out, boom, oh shit, I missed it again. He pulls it back, I got it, I pull it. Step around, just keep moving. Actually, I'm pulling and breaking right now. Um, let's have you guys, so we don't actually have to break the arm. Okay? Boom. I uh, pull, step around. Once they bump the knee, just drop the weapon, and we'll get back. Okay? 
I'm expecting you guys to understand that's a, that's a clean break. <laughs> Got it? Alright, let's go. We'll go uh, old school uh, Japanese Jiu Jitsu, uh, Cody Yash. So, same thing again. He stabs, full, okay, as he comes back. Alright, I'll uh, come right over here, guys. So, watch the hands. This is what Kenny and I were just playing with. So, as he's pulling back, this hand's gonna come to the front. Come to the front. Then my rear hand folds over the top. All right? Now, it comes over the top. I'm now just gonna drop it. Alright? Just keep that wrist. Again, okay. There. Boom. Okay. He pulls it back. We'll switch it. It feels like I'm pushing into him. I right? also when I cut him with it. This hand travels to the inside. So my fingers are facing. I keep that grip and just pull. Keep the pressure on the wrist. Again. So I got it. Boom. Pulls it back. Folds it. Slower. Oh, good. <laughs> a few more times. <laughs> One more slow. So, okay. So here, boom. He pulls it back, follows it in. Hand rotates. So I have like a C grip over here, and I have like a like a baseball grip here. The heel, of my palm, so it's rotating that wrist in, trying to grab it. So now the one's got his like handle, right? Now I twist and push the handle and pull down on it. I keep that pull that controls the wrist. I can keep that away. Okay, uh, let's really quickly review a couple of the angles that we can take when coming in. Uh, first series we did, we were kind of taking an outside line by using a low half to put them in. If you start looking at some of the stuff we're doing, even like when I'm low halfing, I'm loading this hand, but my hand is almost ready to go. That It's got a shot right there, okay? Now, if this is hypothetically my low half position to get the outside line, I'm going to flip the switch. All right, so now this is my in like on my inside line, so the knife is coming here, I'm looking to get this to keep it away from my body. But now instead of throwing that punch I did with the left, this becomes like an external hammer to a shot here. So I love um, like a hack at the vagus nerve at the side of the neck. All right, once you hit this, you're gonna create a nice reaction in the brain, there's a little disconnect. And that's all I'm looking for. We're talking about knife fighting or, or survival. We're looking for a small little milliseconds to survive. So that thing comes in, it's like jamming. I'm hitting hard here, okay? Now I don't stop hitting, whether I move this out, I add a knee first, I add a headbutt. Uh, I'm looking to enter in with structure, with, 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 with violence, all right? When I get this, and spin, okay. When I get this right here, it's very important that to close off this line. So when I do this, I rotate over and push my body. So he, I'm trying to almost make it, he can't stab himself. I'm trying to push my bicep into his forearm so he can't get that arm out. Grab the back of his head, ear, neck, whatever I can, and I'm gonna knee the fuck out of him until he's compliant, and then just rotate his shoulder down to the ground until he's flat. I add pressure until he drops that knife. Now I control again. If I need to arrest him, I stay glued to him, ask for his other arm. Ah, so here again, he comes in, and we're looking to jam and just block everything we can. We just want to get this hand to the inside line and stop his forward progress, all right? Now, I know he's going to be pulling back, so he's pulling back, I'm looking for that control, I'm looking to add my knee strikes. I can hit him, whatever I can. I get him closing off that line. I don't want this to be free flow so he has cuts and stabs on me, all right? Once I get here, it's like, no, you're not allowed to go anywhere now. Someone driving my shoulder into his wrist, which gives a great control all over his body and how we want to hit him. Now I've broken it down, just rotate, think about rotating my elbow to his shoulder, which drives him to the ground. I keep that pressure. He drops the knife, I break the arm. Now I've got control if I need to. I keep him pinned. Now, the objective is when he stabs, we're not going to try to grab it. We're going to create this like called frame, all right, to keep it away for us, all right? And we're also trying to be entering in, boom. So we want to keep that knife on the outside. We're also trying to score here, keep that in. I'm going to step through and add a knee. All right. I got a couple options here. It all depends on what he does. First, we're always going to try to break that elbow right there. If I can just break that elbow, that arm, that arm is gone. He may turn his wrist, when he turns and catch, capture, capture, this is what we're really gonna do today. Capture this wrist right here. Or step back and pull on it until he drops it and fuck him up a little bit. So again, same hollow offense, so boom, knee, okay? 
Now, I, if he tries it, I'm just gonna keep wrenching on it. If he bends it and come down, grab here, right at the, right at the wrist level, and just bring him down and get him. So, one more time. One, two, okay. Try to break it there, catch it on the wrist, and then bend. So, um, for, the, for the purpose on the street, you can grab and, and hold the blade in either hand. Um, it doesn't matter, it's the same, or an impact weapon in either, either hand. But for the arm program that we have, we always gonna carry the blade on the left side and the gun on the right side. Or if we don't have a gun on the right side, the blade on the left side, and then imp another impact weapon on the right side, or a double knife, okay? The reason being that we wanna get used to using the lead fast hand with the blade and the rear with the gun, drawing the gun, because we have gun and knife, and we're integrating both. So on the arm program, we would focus all our strategy with the blade, with lead hand striking. So we'd be punching and hammering with, with the empty hand here, or palming and hammering with the empty hand here. We're not gonna really fight from here when we have a gun, okay? Because we wanna be able to access the gun when we need it, okay? The blade comes out a lot quicker than the gun. So a lot of, in the arm program, we can draw the blade a lot faster than we can the gun. But the blade will give us time to get the gun out, and then we'll play with both together. If I have time, I'll take the gun out directly if, I, if, if, if it warrants that use of force. But for the arm program, so you get it. But being that where I'm just showing you, you can do both hands, it doesn't matter, okay? But, um, so we're gonna do the same drill with the blade. So before we had impact weapon, now we have the blade in our left hand, okay? So here's the blade, and then we do the same thing, punch, internal frame palm internal frame chop internal frame punch external frame palm external frame chop external frame punch descending frame palm descending frame chop descending frame ascending punch Ascending frame, palm ascending frame, chop ascending frame, direct. Punch direct frame, chop direct frame, palm direct frame. That's if I did a 180 turn, I'd be doing all this from the rear now, with the lead hand being the setup. Okay? That would be empty hand first with the lead, and then rear. So it would be punch. Rear internal frame, palm, rear internal frame, chop, rear internal frame. And we go through all of them again. Does that make sense? It depends where I am with the opponent. I don't have the luxury of saying, hold on, let me turn around so my lead hand is there. I just have to turn and deal with it, okay? And then it'll bring us into how we turn. So if I'm on this side of my body, I'm gonna frame three. So I make a tight frame and the blade comes under my armpit. Okay, I turn my body first so I can see what I'm going into. Then I move my foot. Then I turn 180 and I go into four. And then I ride up and go back into my fence. On the other side, I go to three. See the blade is away from me. All right, I turn and look. I go to four, I ride up, and I go to my fence. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. At any time, I can frame. So I could use four to block stuff. Obviously, I don't want to be blocking against another blade, but when shit's hitting the fan, I'd rather get hit with my frame with a blade than hit with my fucking neck with a blade. I could fight from the fence and block it too. It's better than getting my neck fucking sliced. Okay, so the guys are like, oh, you should parry. Yeah, parrying's fucking great if I fucking see it coming. But if I'm in a fucking mess of shit, which is usually so fast, you're not gonna have fucking time to see a parry. You're just gonna be fucking getting cut because if somebody's beating the shit out of me behind with a blade, you think I'm gonna be like, oh, Harry? No, I'm gonna be like, holy fuck, let me cover my neckline, turn, and then get cut on my arm instead of my fucking neck. You think you're gonna fucking be seeing a guy from behind you and do fucking knife tapping when you turn around 180 that quick? Better man than I am, I wanna, and I wanna fucking see it. That ain't gonna fucking happen. You're gonna turn around and protect your vitals and live and then get back into the fight from there. You're not gonna turn around and be like, eyes behind my head, and I know there's a fucking internal tap or an external tap, and I'm gonna be able to parry it. I wanna see that fucking shit, that's bullshit. All right, what you're gonna do is try to survive the situation, hopefully not get stabbed in the fucking kidney or anything from behind. If 
But the truth of the matter is, if you're fighting two guys with blades, one's in front, one's behind, you're in deep shit. Okay? Because you only can, you can only defend what you can see. Okay? Anybody says different? Bullshit. Uh, put, put me and Mike with two blades, and I want to see you defend both of us. And it's not going to fucking happen. Defending one guy with a blade is hard enough. Two guys? It's fucking possible. You got to hope for the best and cover as much as you can. Okay? And hopefully they're not that good. You can shield. You can go after this guy's shield and turn him in. Absolutely. But, you know, to think like you're going to turn around and be able to know where to block and parry is absurd. That's why you need framing. Because you're going to turn, absorb a cut, and then get right back on the offensive. Does that make sense? It's, we're not Superman. There's only so much you can do against a blade. This fucking thing, it just touches you and you're in trouble. You know, cuts, veins, it's bad. It's not like punching where you can take a shot or an impact weapon where you can take a shot. A blade, it cuts you. You get cut in the wrong spot, you die. Period. All right, so let's not have any uh, bullshit about that, all right? And the knife guys would love to say tapping, 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 and all this different stuff. <laughs> That's only if you see the, the strike coming. If you don't see it, you get stuck and cut, you fucking die, you know? So framing is a necessary evil against even a blade because you can only tap what you can see coming, and you can only parry a punch what you can see coming. The thing is, a lot of times you don't see the punches coming, and you don't see the blade attacks coming, so the framing at least keeps you alive until you can parry, okay? I'm not saying parry's not, not good, parry's good, but it's, it's only good when I can see what's coming at me. The truth of the matter is most of the time I don't see the attack and the framing 